Hey folks, how's it going? Now, if you can't wait to get your hands on Quantum Break, you're probably wishing you had some of Jack Joyce's time manipulation powers to fast forward to that April the 5th release date. We can't do that, but what we can do is travel back in time to take a look at some of the phenomenal titles from the consistently quirky and brilliant Finnish developer Remedy and see how they paved the way for Quantum Break. We pick up the story over 20 years ago when a small company formed out of the demo scene in Helsinki where the winters are long and the development cycles are even longer. Remedy have shown that they are all about quality over quantity with a small library of games that are as beautifully crafted as Sam Lake's jawline. This was way back before the days of the original Xbox and their first game was a quirky top-down PC racing shooter called Death Rally. Even back then the gameplay was spot on. Released in 1996, Death Rally showed that games didn't need to be complex to be awesome. It was smooth, it was responsive, and insanely fun to blow other racers away with your chain guns and your landmines. You could even tamper with an opponent's car before a race if you were finding them a bit too tricky to beat. Not that I would ever do anything like that. No way. It may seem small now, but Death Rally was the birth of that intensity and grit that has since become a staple of Remedy's creations. A remake has since been released on tablet and PC with all new graphics, customization, an online multiplayer, and trust me, it is no Sunday drive. Death Rally was also Remedy's first dip into the pool of pop culture references and in-jokes, which has become a staple of all their titles. And there were competitors named Duke Nukem, Jane Honda, and even Alan Wake's sleazy, cheesy agent Barry Wheeler appearing in the remake alongside Angry Bird's Mighty Eagle. That's a list of characters that would make for an interesting, if somewhat messy, carpool. At this point, we jump forward to 2001. Remedy have a brand new logo as the original one had raised a few legal eyebrows from a gaming giant in a galaxy far, far away. Not only that, but they've gone big on 3D benchmarking, developing software that would eventually turn into 3D Mark. This demo software was all the rage for showing off just how meaty the new 3D graphics cards were that have now become de facto in any serious gaming rig. So it's 2001, the original Xbox had just launched and the world had gone matrix mad with everyone wearing knee length leather trench coats and boots bigger than the Duke controller. And I mean everyone. And it was actually part of the 3D Mark demo we all got our first glimpse of what was to become Max Payne. And boy, did it look good. Who was this super cool dude leaping around in slow motion while dishing out bullets like they were going out of fashion? The lobby setting for this was definitely more than a nod to The Matrix, even though the game had been in development long before the film hit cinemas. Yes, this was Max Payne, the name that every teenage boy wanted to have at school, but it was also the name of one of the most iconic games of the noughties. Detective Max is forced to face the gritty underworld after his wife and daughter are murdered in a twisted noir action masterpiece, all brought to life by the writing legend that is Sam Lake, and really set the template for what we think of as a Remedy game. The combination of strong narrative, classic hero's journey, pop culture references, and rock solid but innovative gameplay mechanics runs through everything they have done since. The writing took its influences from classic film noir and was more hard-boiled than my gran's eggs. The whole game was set in New York City during the worst blizzard on record, which if you've ever been to Finland would be classed as a nice spring day. Sam Lake and the team drew on Norse myths and created a world inhabited by Russian mobsters, old school mafioso, corrupt cops, a shadowy government organisation and an assassin called Mona Sachs. Sam even put himself in the game as the face of Max himself, which I reckon is such an incredibly and unashamedly egocentric piece of work that it deserves all the credit in the world. He's particularly recognisable in the now iconic comic book style cutscenes where he certainly had a slightly constipated look on more than one occasion, and you'll know this now as Max Payne Face. <clears throat> Gameplay in Max Payne was like no other at the time. The third person action and gunplay went hand in hand with the dark tone of the game and the introduction of bullet time as a core mechanic placed it into another league of epicness. The ability to aim and shoot in slow motion all while performing epic dives and rolls with dual wielded weapons made you feel like the biggest badass going and has since been riffed on in tons of titles like Red Dead Redemption right through to something like Super Hot. Pretty much another first was the cinematic switching to a third person view circling a falling body when the final enemy in a group is taken down and even following the bullet from a sniper rifle. Now this at the time was a mind meltingly cool mechanic but it's now a staple in action in RPG games with Fallout especially owing more than a debt to it. 
The New York Minute and Dead on Arrival mode seriously ramped up the challenge with level time limits and restricted saves per level, which really made you feel the pain. And that's pain with a A-Y-N-E, just to, so we're clear. Most of the gameplay is based around the bullet time action, but levels also feature surrealistic nightmares and drug-related hallucinations from the tortured mind of Max, a device we've seen cropping up in Batman Arkham series, and even Fallout 4 again, and of course, Alan Wake. So we've got third person action, we've got deep narrative, and we've got time manipulation mechanics. Sounds a bit familiar, doesn't it? Quantum Break is definitely taking this Remedy blueprint to a whole new level. Max Payne went on to win a truckload of awards, and I'd seriously need to be able to pause time to list them all here, and it also led to the inevitable sequel. It was two long years before Remedy finally gave their fans the sequel they were craving, with the arrival of Max Payne 2, The Fall of Max Payne. Now whilst Max himself may have been falling, the standard of Remedy's storytelling and narrative combo was certainly on the up. The game kept all of what made the original special intact whilst overhauling in a few key areas. A big change was the physics engine, as items such as projectiles, shell casings, and even enemies moved in a manner you would expect and making the whole thing feel a lot more dynamic. Interestingly, this game was subtitled A Film Noir Love Story and was a statement of Remedy's ambition to combine games and film, with Quantum Break really being the ultimate realisation of this. The game has an episodic structure, in-game TV shows and even proper actors this time. No offence, Sam Lake. And the better tech allowed for a few more facial expressions as well. The Fall of Max Payne picks up the story two years later. Max has been reinstated as an NYPD detective even after all the carnage of the first game. He encounters Mona Sachs, who he thought was dead, and the police station is suddenly attacked by hitmen looking for her. She is trouble. The pair escape and team up again, this time with Mona playable in some sections, to resolve a conspiracy of death and betrayal but mainly to do lots more cool diving through the air, dual wielding pistols in slow-mo. Yes, the same rock solid gameplay was back, but with the addition of grenades and molotovs plus melee attacks if you got up close and personal. Max still pops more painkillers to restore health than can seriously be good for anyone, which perhaps partly explains the woozy lucid dream sequences. We also saw Remedy's use of in-game TV series, reflecting the in-game story. The comic strips you'd happen upon in the first game, Captain Baseball Bat Boy, are now cartoons that you'll find on TVs dotted around the world, with more parallels to what is going on with Max at that point. These are credited in-game to Sammy Waters. I wonder who that could be a reference to. Other TV series within the game are Undress Unknown, Lords and Ladies, and my personal favourite, Dick Justice. Which doesn't sound wrong at all. Dick Justice is basically a retelling of the story from the first Max Payne. Dick Justice, a lone, hard-boiled fugitive cop, framed for the murder of his wife. This fascination with TV and film was something that would lead us to where we are today with Quantum Break's fully blown TV series, but beforehand would also be explored in Alan Wake. Seven years pass us by and everything was very hush-hush over at Remedy. Max Payne had been passed over to the very capable hands of Rockstar Games for Max Payne 3, and Mark Wahlberg took on the mantle of his constipated face for the so-so film adaptation that, if nothing else, managed to capture the iconic art style of the games. But little was known of what to expect of Remedy's next project, which had already taken five years to develop. Psychological thriller Alan Wake. At E3 in 2005 we got our first look, but it was not much more than a technically impressive demo of the weather and day and night cycles in a beautiful Pacific Northwest setting. This was as much a showcase for the power of the next-gen consoles, and even in development the game became a real flag bearer for what the Xbox 360 would be capable of. Even if we didn't know much of what the game was about at the time, the stunning demo and the Twin Peaksy setting and references to psychological horror and overall Stephen King vibe was enough to get me super excited, especially with Remedy behind the project. Interestingly enough, there was talk at the time of the setting, the Pacific Northwest town of Bright Falls, being an open world in the GTA mold, which was all the rage back then. Thankfully, they didn't go down that route though, and focused on the tightly scripted and tense action and drama. Eventually, the game came out in 2010 and we got our hands on Alan Wake. Hint, A. Wake. He's a horror writer who shares a similarly troubled past to Mr. Payne, 
and his vacation to the Twin Peaksy style Bright Falls does little to shift his writer's block, but it does succeed in taking Alan's wife away from him. Poor old Al then has to spend the remainder of his time fighting the Taken, shadowy beings that have become enveloped by a dark force. Alongside a typically brilliant Remedy story, gameplay was giving a new dynamic edge to change up the classic run and gun style. Taken on the Taken meant first removing their shield by weakening them with light, then finishing them off with the weapon of your choice. This meant gameplay had a more strategic element to it as you were required to plan attacks on your enemies around what light sources were available to you. This fight with light mechanic really put a different spin on action combat. Quantum Break has really taken this and run with it with Jack Joyce's array of time powers. Alan Wake also stepped up the TV show ambitions by being told in an episodic format complete with cliffhangers, episode recaps and brilliant story pacing. The game was structured with six episodes and two DLC special episodes, The Signal and The Writer. By the end of it all, you felt like you had been on a real journey with Alan. A tortured journey into a deeply disturbed mind, but a journey nonetheless. Not only that, but as in Max Payne earlier, there were a number of TVs scattered throughout Bright Falls that you could turn on and enjoy short episodes of a fictional Twilight Zone influenced series, Night Springs. As in Max Payne, these would parallel what was going on at the game at that point, and you might even have spotted a fan of the show in earlier demos for Quantum Break. There's even a live action video at the end of the game where Alan Wake is the guest on a talk show and the other guest is Sam Wake, who's asked by the host to do the Max Payne face. The musical guest on the show are the Poets of the Fall, who not only provided songs for Max Payne and Alan Wake, but also are the real band behind the legendary Old Gods of Asgard and that truly epic gig scene from Alan Wake. And as if that wasn't enough world blending for you, you could also find posters for the original Remedy game Death Rally and even find a playable version on an arcade machine. This isn't where the TV crossover ends though, as a few weeks before the launch, Bright Falls, an accompanying live action web series, was released on Xbox Live. The series really went heavy on the Twin Peaks vibe and was a prequel to the game with Jake, a newspaper reporter, visiting town and encountering several of the game's characters. During his time in Bright Falls, he starts to suffer from blackouts and develops a crippling aversion to daylight. It's a bit like my teenage years, really. Eventually, he seems to be taken over completely by the Dark Presence and vanishes just before Alice and Alan Wake arrive in town to kickstart the game. Just be careful through this next stretch of road. Okay, thanks. Remedy's last creation before Quantum Break took center stage is another Alan Wake piece. Having discovered that he has been missing from the real world for nearly two years, Alan discovers that he needs to rewrite history if he's going to stop his evil doppelganger, Mr. Scratch, from taking everything he loves. This Xbox Live Arcade exclusive was moderately well received, but lacked Remedy's increasing fascination with episodic TV style formatting and live action elements. But all of that was to change very soon indeed. So that brings us pretty much up to date as we await the release of Quantum Break. And that's been a long wait, with our first glimpses of the game being over three years ago now. And just as Alan Wake was before it, it's been used as a real showcase for the power of the next generation of Xbox, being very much front and centre of the Xbox One since its launch. Quantum Break brings together everything Remedy have done brilliantly so far. The rock solid and innovative action gameplay mechanics from Bullet Time and Max Payne, to fight with light in Alan Wake are pushed even further with a full suite of time powers that are an absolute blast to play around with and look and sound absolutely incredible. If bullet time let you quickly manipulate time to your advantage, Quantum Break lets you grab time by the scruff of the neck, put it on a lead and make it obey your every command. As per Alan Wake, the whole game is formatted along the style of an episodic TV box set. And it's on the TV side that Remedy have really surpassed themselves. They've delivered a game with full 22 minute live action TV episodes with proper Hollywood production values and talent. And in true Remedy tradition, these multi-branching episodes lace throughout the game, looking at the story from an alternative viewpoint, in this case, that of the villain, Paul Serene. So all there is to do now is wait and count down those days, hours and minutes till the game is released on April the 5th. Don't forget that if you pre-order you can get Alan Wake on Back Compat and Alan Wake American Nightmare to either serve as a refresher on how good Remedy games are 
or get you up to speed on what you've missed. Let me know in the comments what your favourite remedy moments are and also the best Easter egg you've found in their games and there's a lot in there. I mean seriously, the Easter Bunny's a bit worried he's going to go out of business here. Thank you for watching, leave us a like if you enjoyed this history of remedy and make sure you subscribe to Xbox On for a lot more like this and remember, time is power.